Okay, everybody, we're back again, and uh, we're doing our last analysis for Project 2 before we start on Project 3 next week. Uh, and this is going to be visibility analysis in general, but we're going to do some view sheds, and then we're going to do some cumulative view shed slash total view shed or visual scape kind of analysis. So first thing is that uh, what we're going to want to do is to make a new map set to work in. So if everybody... Uh, uh, remembers from the last time how I showed you how to do this is pretty straightforward. Um, you basically make sure you're you know in the location that you want to be if you have more than one location, in this case the Wadi Hasa one, and we just go up to the little tool here, this is create new location in the current grass uh, data, oh, sorry, not new location, uh, new map set in the current location is what we want, and we click that and since this is going to be visibility analysis, I'm just going to write visibility so that I can keep that uh, straight in my set of different map sets. So we'll click OK. And it, uh, when you add the new one, it switches over to that is the current map set. So that means we're good to go at this particular moment. Um, so what we can do is very quickly add in our uh, 30 meter SRTM. And uh, let's just put in our WHS sites points as well because we're going to want to see all of that uh, for the time being. And now we can click on the layers tab. You know, you can style your vector points, etc., if you want at this particular point in time. But I'm just going to go with the black X's. Um, so the first thing that we are going to do is to do just a real basic single view shed. And the tool for that lives here under the raster menu. And uh, what we'll want to do is to find where it actually is. It's under Terrain Analysis. And if you go down to Visibility, R.ViewShed. And it was everything in grass. It pops up its own module. And you can make it big. And I just want to refresh your memory that all of these things have uh, the manual page, which is pretty helpful. And in this case, since there's a lot of options and uh, things that you might want to mess around with, you know, uh, it's very important that before you mess around with some of those values, you open up the manual page and read more specifically about what they are. Now, I'm going to go over all the basics so you can get up and running with this. But again, there's a, a lot of things that you can uh, change because these are models, you know, and uh, you might want to make the model more or less detailed or more refined for your purposes or not. So uh, if you recall, that uh, what this module is going to do is to take the, the elevations in our DEM and we're going to put a viewing point and it's going to you know look from that direction towards the horizon line and anywhere the view is obstructed it's going to break the line of sight anywhere where the view is unobstructed it's going to have a continuous line of sight so the places that have an unobstructed line of sight will be coded one for visible in the places that are obstructed are going to be coded zero for not visible. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is to tell it the elevation. So we'll put in our 30 meter SRTM DEM in that slot. And uh, we're going to give an output name for this. You know, this is going to be a throwaway one just because I'm demonstrating. But if this was a meaningful view location, you'd want to give it a meaningful name. So if it's like from the tallest mountain, put the name of the mountain underscore view shed or something like that. So I'm just going to call this test v shed so that I can easily find and I know that test means it's something I can delete and don't have to worry about too much. Now it's going to ask for the coordinates easting and northing and you'll recall that we did something similar when we did our um, least cost path uh, analysis uh, last week. And so in this particular case, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to zoom in on one of these uh, locations that are kind of on a slight up, uptick. And, and the way I know this is I can add the, uh, you know, the raster legend. So I'll add that for the DEM and I can see which values are higher and which are lower. So in this particular area, these little sites that are up on this little ridge top it's the very end of this ridge top. This is a nice little spot. So I'm just going to arbitrarily use my query tool and I'm going to click somewhere in between this little cluster of sites. And as before, I can right click on that 
and I can copy the coordinates out of the query. And I can then right click and paste them over here. So that gives me my little viewing location of right in this particular spot right here. And uh, uh, by default, it sets it to 1.75 meters above the ground, which is the average height of a human being. You can change this to zero if you want someone laying down on the ground, or if the viewing is from a tower, you could raise this up to you know three, four meters or whatever it is. For the offset viewing, remember that's, that's as if somebody was standing on the place that you're looking at, so it would raise those points up a little bit. I'm gonna leave that zero for now. Um, here we could add a, a specific delineation in distances, meters away from the viewpoint. If you set it to minus one, it will say it can view all the way to the horizon. But if you want to, you can code this anything, you know, less than that. So if it's like a kilometer is the maximum distance you care about, you can put 1000 here and that's what it would do. And again, you can also limit the aspect, uh, the azimuth of the compass away from east that you're looking in. So if you only care about the vista in a particular direction, you can set a range of degrees from east, beginning and end, and it will only show us the vista in that di di direction. I always like to check this, consider the effect of atmospheric re refraction. If we're talking about human vision, why not? It doesn't really add that much time to it. You don't have to, and if you want, read about this, and you can change this depending on your different um, atmospheric conditions, like fog and that kind of stuff. Um, I also really like to check this output format, uh, invisible zero, visible one format. Uh, by default, it kind of does it slightly differently, but I like to check this, so I'm gonna check this box now. And curvature of the Earth, I always turn that on because, again, we want the horizon line to be realistic. We we don't want to have some unrealistic amount. And view shot analysis can be memory intensive. So depending on how much RAM you have in your computer, you can increase the amount of memory. I have a decent amount of RAM in my computer. This is my laptop, so I'm not going to go too crazy. I'll give it two gigabytes to do it. And uh, that should be good. I'll hit run. If you uh, note that this is taking a very long time, then uh, consider increasing the RAM even more because that's one of the limiting factors, okay? So here it is. Uh, and if I query this guy, you'll see that the purple is zero and the yellow is one. So everything in yellow can be seen from my little input location. In order to make some sense of this, um, what we're probably gonna wanna do is to add the, it in as a hill shade, uh, colored on top of a hill shade. So I am going to uh, just remove the, the view shed layer. I'm going to add in uh, where it says various rest layers. I'm going to pick my shaded relief. I'm going to pick the shaded relief that we made in. Oh, yes, I have to change my map set search paths like I showed you last time as well. Uh, map set access and make sure that I have terrain analysis check because that's where my hillshade map is. Uh, and then I got to find, that was our view shed, there, D shade. So now I can go in there and uh, pick my shaded relief. And now I can overlay my test view shed on top of that. And remember, I always like to start brightening it by around 30 or so. And there we go. So now we get a real nice uh, uh, view of what's going on over here. And let's uh, zoom out to the whole Wadi Hassa region so we can see what's visible and what's not visible. And if you like, you can try and figure out why this is. You can zoom in onto your initial point of view. You can put this into 3D perspective view. Try and put yourself in there, which is kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, or, or you can continue to make different view sheds uh, manually with uh, our view shed at this point. What I will do is um, just pop over to the 3D view. Remember, turn off your shaded relief before you do that. Uh, and then 
I will go to my data tab. I will increase the fine resolution. Oops, increase meaning make the number smaller. <laughs> and I'll scroll down to where it says color and I'm gonna pick test view shed there. And now I have uh, set it so that my test view shed is the color and um, I should actually go back down here and, and, and make my raster, I mean my vector uh, sites a little bit uh, smaller. Just make sure, yeah, Wadi House of Sites is selected and show vector points and I can reduce the, the size of that here. Let me just see why, there we go. Too small now. Let's see. Well, maybe I maybe I made them way too small. <laughs> I can put that back to sphere and see. Maybe if I make them white, that would have been nice to be. Oh, there they are. Yeah, I made them way too small. Always a little bit fun. Again, these are in map units, so I guess. Uh, and also, if I expand this window a little bit, we should be able to see the actual number in there. But for me, it's a little bit hard to see. But anyway. That's about right in terms of the size right there. And now I can uh, sort of zoom in on the basic middle part where I put my viewpoint, which is somewhere in here. And I can start to get a perspective of what's visible and what's not visible. And uh, especially if I set my Z exaggeration up to two or something like that, I can uh, really start to see why I'm able to see certain parts of the landscape versus others, right? I think it makes some sense how this is all working. Okay, so we'll switch back to the 2D view. And here's where we're gonna do something a little bit more interesting than just making single view sheds. We're gonna do that kind of cumulative view shed analysis or the total view shed analysis. Um, to do this, we're gonna to need to add in an add-on that I created that does it sort of uh, for you. So uh, to add an add-on, you go to settings, add-ons extensions and then where it says install extensions for add-ons g dot extension and it gives you this nice little module here that helps you find all the add-ons that community developers like myself create for grass and they're sort of listed in the basic categories of the menu items up here this particular one is a raster one and uh, by the way i created this so uh, if anything doesn't work for you I'm the one you complain to. <laughs> I can probably fix it for you. Um, and just scroll down. It's called r.viewshed.cva, standing for cumulative view shed analysis. So go down to the end. And there it is. Highlight it. And then just hit install. Now I've pre installed mine, so I'm not going to do it again. And due to the way I've installed Grass 8 on Linux, um, it doesn't work the way it will on yours because what will happen is it will download the source code, it'll compile it, and it will install it so that when you go into the tools menu over here, there'll be a new one that says add-ons and all your add-ons will show up here. Now again, because of the way I installed Grass 8 on my computer here, I get errors when I try and use G-Extension uh, because I don't have permission for the place where it's compiled. Uh, to install. So instead I manually installed it and I can uh, type into my terminal which on Linux is always in the background uh, r.viewshed.cva. If I hit enter right now it'll lock the terminal so I'll put this little ampersand code which in Linux tells it to start this process but keep the terminal free for typing more commands in. Uh, and when we do that it'll just pop up the graphical interface. So if you uh, are doing this on uh, uh, on a Mac or on a PC, or if you're uh, if you've installed it on Linux through the package manager or something like that, you should at this point see add-ons. You should click it, and you'll see our view shed CVA there. You can just double click it here from the tools menu. If it doesn't show up like that after you install it, just find your little terminal and type in the name of it. Put the little ampersand, hit enter, and you will get this little window popping up just like this. Okay. So what this is, it's a little wrapper for the our view shed that we just used, 
but instead of asking you to put in one coordinate it will accept a vector points file and it will run through them using each point as the view point create the viewshed map you can parameterize it the same way and uh, in in doing so what it will do is uh, uh, concatenate them and create a, either a single file at the end where all the values are coded between zero completely invisible from all the points to the maximum number of points you know that was in your vector points file meaning the point was visible by all of them so if you have a hundred points it would be coded zero to a hundred theoretically and if it's a code of five it's visible from five distinct viewpoints that particular cell on the landscape um, one way to do this would be to put in the points of a known uh, you know phenomenon so um, what I will real quickly do is uh, just do a real quick SQL query and pull out a, a sample of sites from the Wadi Hassa main uh, database so uh, I showed you one way to do this which is to um, find your vector points right click on it sh show the attribute data and when that pops up, you would use the SQL builder or the simple SQL query, then right click and save out as. I don't know why this is taking a thousand years to load up <laughs> on, on this particular day when I'm trying to record a video. Um, so let me just pause while it's doing that and see what the deal is. All right, just had to close grass and restart again, and now it's working just fine. Anyway, uh, you know, you get the attribute table data up, you have your browse data tab, and you can create, uh, you know, the simple SQL query here, like I showed you before in the SQL query video. And then once the things are selected, you right click, and then you extract selected features. That's definitely one way to do it. It's an easy way to do it, because you get, a, you get the access to the nice SQL builder. Uh, I note that some of you have had issues with the SQL Builder in this particular module, or maybe you just want to do it the old school, sort of more manual way. So the workaround is to go to the vector menu file, query vector map, and pick, uh, oops, feature selection, select by attributes v dot extract, and here. Uh, you can do basically the same thing, so I'm just going to take out all the PN uh, sites, and uh, what I'll do is uh, make this a little bigger so we can read it. All you have to do is to type in your SQL query under the selection uh, right here. So we don't have to write the where keyword, so we can put where PN equals 1. If I'm doing this correctly from memory, it will select all the pottery Neolithic sites, and that should do it. And I can hit run. What did I do wrong here? Select where PN. Let me just open the table. Like, how about I open the table again? Oops. And uh, make sure I'm putting in the right codes. Yeah. Let's see. Again, doing this on my laptop where I don't have my nice mouse. Uh, finding, oops. See, it's doing it. My little trackpad is doing it by itself. Uh, PN, okay. This is a lot of fun. Okay, so let's see if I do it the old school way. Uh, I mean, not the old school way, the, the modern way, and selected PN equals 1, and it applies, so it's doing it that way. So theoretically, I should have been able to do, oh, I shouldn't have put the quotes again, SQL. Isn't SQL fun? If I hit run, boom, it will do it. So it's the same exact thing that I did right here, uh, but I guess slightly less WYSIWYG and interactive. Uh, so here's my new PN sites. I like it because there's only like five of them. That's why I picked this time frame. 
Uh, and now, uh, since I restarted Grass, I have to restart my RVShed CVA. So we're back where we were. I'm going to pick my DEM. Now I'm going to pick my little PN sites. You can pick whatever subset, maybe the one you already made. And so I'm going to call this the PN CVA uh, map. Now here, if I wanted to keep all the interim single view sheds, I could check this box. That's useful if you just want to make a whole bunch of view sheds from these input points. You don't care about CVA, but you want to make a bunch of view sheds. You can do it this way. Let's consider the curvature of the earth. Let's consider rarefaction. Uh, at this point, it doesn't matter. Uh, I like, I guess I set the default to, to be looking for a person, so I'll leave that alone. And amount of memory, I'll up that to 2000 again. And the rest of this doesn't matter for our purpose here, so we'll hit run. Now again, this is gonna do a single view shed for every single input point. So it could take quite some time. I'm going to pause the video while it runs. OK, so for five input points, it only took about a minute or so on my little laptop here. But if you had more, it will take longer. And we'll see because we're going to do about 100 in a minute. Um, you'll see that it's done removing temporary view shed maps because we didn't check to keep them all. And then that's it. Let's add in the map that it made. And uh, we'll just do it manually here. Uh, it's called PNCVA. And here we go. And so if we add the, uh, let me make this map display just a little bit bigger. So we can see this a little nicer. If we add in the raster legend for that, we'll see that it, these are, um, I'm just gonna make this a little smaller so it's not so ridiculous and uh, let's see if I can change the font there we are font settings to white okay so now we can see zero invisible from all of those uh, five places one only one of them can see it two two of them can see it three all three of well three of them can see it and there's five so there's no part of the landscape that's visible by more than three of these pottery neolithic sites which is kind of an interesting thing and we can see this over here and if I'm to add this in as a uh, as a hill shade so that we can get a sense of the topography underneath it we'll see what part of the landscape that actually is so let me pick my shaded relief and then I'll put my Pottery Neolithic CVA over it. And again, I'm going to brighten her up just a little bit. And there we go. We can see it's this ridge line. All these sites, um, because the survey was done on just on this side of the wadi, all the sites are on this side of the wadi, so they can see across to the other bank, and they can see this ridge. So this ridge is a highly visible spot if you're living in one of these Pottery Neolithic villages. Um, the rest of the landscape, considering the small number of villages we have, is pretty invisible. Now, is this meaningful? The answer is it depends. Again, there's sampling error here because the survey only happened to the south. We don't have any of the pottery analytics sites to the north. Um, and also, it's not a f totally full coverage survey, so we don't have all the pottery analytics sites. So this view shed, this cumulative view shed, is interesting but it's not the full story and it's certainly potentially misleading if we ran with this and tried to tell this is a special spot on the landscape, they can all see this spot. It could be coincidental as well. So what we need to do is to remove those biases by doing the total view shed analysis or uh, making a visual scape of the basic visual visuality of the landscape by picking a bunch of random sites. Now, we'd wanna pick a good number of, uh, a good percentage of the landscape if we wanted to do this very rigorously but in our case we just want something that's reasonably well covered so we're just going to pick a hundred sites again a rule of thumb would be pick a number that's about one percent coverage for the entire area and uh, you can do it on a regular grid but i think it's just as valid maybe if not statistically more valid to pick a random sample as long as the random sample is large enough 
So to do that, we need to make 100 random points. So we're going to go to Vector menu, and we're going to go down to uh, Generate Points. And uh, we're going to pick the one that says Generate Random Points, V.Random. And here we're just going to call this Rand Points 100. It's, you don't want to start with a, with a number like a you know 100 rand points would, would maybe throw an error when you try to do some sql stuff so we're going to start with the the letters and here we're going to put in 100 100 points we could put as many points as we wanted here um, and by the way if we wanted to make this statistical there's another module that we can just put the percentage of coverage and that one is actually in the raster menu and it says generate random cells and it's R random and you can totally use R random instead of V random in this case because you can also make random vector points uh, but here I'll just you know we're gonna use this in the next project so we'll learn a little bit more about it but here where it says number of points you can see you can actually put a percent so I can actually put one percent over here and it would actually sample the landscape randomly at a one percent density so if I wanted to do a 1% coverage, this is what I would do. But I'm showing you vRandom because all we need is 100 points because uh, it would take your computer a long time probably to do a cumulative view shed analysis with even just a 1% sample of this like 10 million cell landscape. Um, okay, and that's basically it. Uh, we just hit run over here. And looks like it did it already. So if I uh, turn off the view shed so we can see, there's our 100 uh, random points spread around the landscape. Some are closer together, but we have a decent coverage, right? And again, we're doing 100 because this analysis is computationally intensive. 100 will get you a decent uh, total view shed without bogging your computer down like overnight as it tries to chug through it, okay? So uh, what we are going to do is to find our uh, R view shed CVA, and we're going to go back to the required tab, and we're going to pick our new random points 100, and we're going to call this total v shed. And I'm just going to put 100 points, just so I know in the future if I do one of the higher density, this is the lower density one. Okay. Everything else we're going to leave the same. I'm going to hit run on this and I'm going to po definitely pause the video because this will take uh, a little while on my laptop here. So we'll come back when it's done. Whoa, okay, sorry. Having a little work done also on the house today. Uh, that only took a few minutes for me, actually more like 10 15 minutes to, to run the 100 individual uh, sites. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. I'm just going to add my shaded relief map, you know, that I have my other one. And then I'm just going to open it up again. And I am going to switch it for my total view shed 100. And now I think you'll see a slightly different pattern <laughs> of what's visible and what's not visible. And if I update my uh, raster legend over here, and pick the total view shed 100 and uh, I'm going to have to resize it because we have a lot more categories here so let's do it like so so now we can see it's between 0 and 24 uh, for now because we're not uh, I haven't showed you how to use the map calculator yet we're just going to leave that and we're going to understand that 24 is actually 24 percent visible from the total landscape. And again, 100 individual points gives us a sense, but it's probably not statistically uh, robust enough to say for sure 24% visibility. But we'll go with it for now because, you know, that's good enough for what we need to do in the, in the class, okay? Just know if you were doing this for real, again, you pick a bigger percentage coverage, 1% at least, up to 10%, and I think you'll get a, a, a decent sample size to where we could actually say 24% coverage and uh, and so if we wanted to normalize this we would have to use the map calculator and in this case we would divide by the maximum number in our case 100 so it would actually equal 0.24 for 24% 0.24 for 
because we chose 100. Uh, if we had some other value, again, we would have to normalize it to get the percentage out of it. So what we'll probably want to do is uh, upload some of these values. And the easiest way is the way I showed you before in the SQL um, query video, in which case you go to the Manage Tables uh, uh, tab of your attribute data here and you add the column. But just to show you, there's always going to pause. Okay, to get out of the way of the jackhammering that's happening in the back of my house, I have come to the front yard, and we can uh, we can continue. So, um, what I've got going on over here is the uh, total view shed, and I mentioned you can uh, you're going to want to upload these values into your selected sites and so I said you can do it the way I showed you before which is to open the attribute uh, table and um, you know add a new column through the manage tables but just to show you that there's always more than one way to do things in grass uh, if you go to the database menu which we haven't looked at yet and you go to vector database connections you can go to the one that says v.db.add column and you can add a column that way as uh, as well. So you pick in the name of your vector sites and uh, you would put the name and type. It's a little bit more complicated so you would want to read the manual because you have to tell it whether it's a, uh, a text file, I mean a text column or an integer column or something like that. So it's simpler, more straightforward to just do it from, from the manage tables tab of the vector attributes table of your particular uh, vector file. So in this case, I'm going to put um, total visibility with the name. And it is an integer value because we haven't divided it. But you could upload it as a double. doesn't really matter. And we'll just hit add. And the other uh, useful thing is that you know all of the columns that we add can show up immediately over here. I have to scroll all the way over. So there, so there it is. And then, as before, what we can just do is go to our vector, and we can go to um, update attributes, and we can sample maps at point locations v what rest, and here is the raster map. We're going to choose our total view shed. And, uh, you know, you can click the Fournier cell since we did it as a, um, as a double. But because these are integer values, we'll just leave that alone for now. And we'll hit run. Oh, and I forgot to pick the column. <laughs> pick the name of the column, which is the new one we added, total visibility. Hit run. So uh, now over here we can hit refresh. And there's our values over here. Now this is not a particularly huge sample. I think there's, what is it, uh, five uh, individual uh, sites for the one that I uh, initially selected. So if I wanted to uh, do better statistics on this, I better have a bigger sample. So uh, what I'm gonna do is to very quickly um, extract out a uh, slightly more robust um, sample site. So I'm going to pause the video so I can do that. And I'm going to upload the visibility patterns for, uh, for a bigger set of sites. So give me just two seconds while I go ahead and do that. Okay, I built my uh, SQL query. And uh, this particular time I picked Nabataean Towers because I thought hey, Towers would be kind of an interesting thing to see if they're put in highly visible spots or not. So uh, there's my SQL query that I built here. I'm doing Nabataean equals one and site type equals single quote TWR for tower. And now I'm just gonna, as before, uh, extract selected features and I'm gonna call this Nabataean towers, okay? I'll click okay. I'll hit uh, close on that guy. And now I got Nabataean towers. I'm gonna open up that attribute table 
And here I'm going to go to my manage tables and my column is going to be total visibility as I did before. And we're just going to add that there as a column. And now I think I still have my V what RAS in the background. I'm going to uh, pick Nabatean Towers and under optional. I'm going to pick my total visibility column. I'm going to hit run. Okay, so that's 52 records. We should have a slightly more robust uh, statistical, um, you know, ability with that number of sites. And let's hit refresh to get our value. So there we go. So we're going to run the Univer as we did before to get the mean and standard deviation. But I'll show you another tool that you can use to get a visual approximation using a histogram. Now I showed you the histogram for rasters, which lives um, up here under Analyze Map. Unfortunately, there's no built-in tool for doing the same thing for vector attribute data, but there is an add-on that you can add. So if we go back to our add-on extensions, and we go to Install Extensions for Add-ons, the G extension, and I'll show you if you go under, um, ve uh, it's not actually under vector, it's under uh, display, and it's uh, called dvect.callhist. And you do the same thing, you just hit install. And again, I told you I did it a funny way on my computer, so I'm just going to type it into here d.vect.callhist. Uh, call hist I put my little ampersand hit enter and there it is so this is kind of neat it will open up a little uh, histogram window for the data the univariate data in a single column of data so it's pretty straightforward you pick your map in this case it's Nabataean Towers and then it says the column containing azimuth okay that's the column of numeric data that you uh, that you want to look at and then you just hit run and it may take just a minute and you'll get this little window popping up and there's your histogram over here so in this particular case I can see that my histogram is not a normal distribution it's actually left skewed because this is again I mentioned Poisson distributions this is probably a, a Poisson phenomenon because there's a hard left over here so we're going to have the average skewed to the left of it, the sort of uh, most frequent, you know, and everything is going to be skewed to the left, okay? So if I ran my mean and median and, uh, you know, standard deviation, I might not get that sense of how my data is actually distributed. It's really useful to look at the histogram. And now I know that almost all of my uh, tower sites are actually located in not particularly visible locations, either zero, one is the most frequent, uh, or two, and there's only a small number that are located in very visible spots with only like one of them, yeah, one of them being located in a very visible spot, which is an interesting thing to know. Um, by the way, you can save this graphic out uh, right here and you can configure it uh, with some of these buttons. This is actually using a not grass native display. This is using a Python statistical program called matplotlib to show you this over here. Um, so that's pretty useful. Uh, and I would say for all of your little columns of query data, you ought to pop up using dvect call hist, the, the histogram for the information. Yeah, you should definitely get the median and mean and the standard deviation, and if it's fairly normally distributed, you can use that to have statistical cutoffs for the, you know, what's significant and what's not significant. But if it's not a perfectly normal distribution, it may be more useful for you to just sort of say, okay, it looks like somewhere around two or three is where uh, I would put my limit, and I wouldn't have a cutoff on the left side of the mean or median because it's a hard stop at zero, and it doesn't make any sense to do that. So uh, that's the basics of visibility analysis. I'm going to show you just one last little fun thing, uh, uh, which I have sort of not showed you yet, which is how to delete something. So if you remember way back when we made that sort of throwaway view shed, and I said I named it test because I could go back and delete it. Well, 
in order to delete it you go to file manage maps and you go down to where it says g dot remove or delete right there now by default grass wants to make sure you don't accidentally delete stuff so you can only delete things that are in the current map set if you want to delete something in a different map set you either have to check a special box in the settings that says i can do that or you have to switch over to the map set and i never check the box because i never trust myself to not accidentally de delete something that has the same name but in a different map set so i suggest you don't check that special box switch over to the map set open up g remove and then you have to check two boxes here so this is a raster map so i have to check that it's a raster map now i can click here and i can find it and if i just hit run right now it will say this is what would be removed if you check this other safety box which is force removal right here the dash f and uh, that is super useful because you get a little sanity check um, did i really want to do that before you actually do it and if you're sure you hit it and now psh, test raster uh, test view shed is gone now if i had a whole bunch of tests like i was just fooling around and i called them all test one thing that i could do is to go here under the pattern and where it says file name search pattern i can use wild cards which are this little asterisk and i can put test asterisks on both sides so it doesn't matter whether the test is at the beginning or the end of the name and if i hit run i've unchecked that box it would actually find it but in my case i deleted it so there's nothing left to find named test and that way it could actually find everything with test somewhere in it and if i checked the f box here it would delete them all and also we're only deleting raster maps if we wanted to also delete vector maps with the name test we would have to check the vector maps things over here okay so again it's trying to make it so you don't delete things by accident but it means you have to make sure you're checking all the boxes before you hit run in order to actually delete the things that you want to delete and finally i i've never mentioned it although most of you have figured out that you can actually save the layer setup over here in a grass workspace file. So you can save it here from the menu, save or save as, and you can load or open them. These are perfectly analogous to the .qgz files from QGIS. They just set, save your current set of layers and the, any stylings that you've applied to it. I tend not to do it in grass uh, simply because I don't usually use grass to make my final fancy colored maps. And so it's not usually too difficult for me just to get back to where I was going just by adding the maps um, but it's useful if you want to get back to a safe state and you don't want to have to la load in all your layers and style them again I think that's about it for this week so I'm going to sign off and uh, again this is the last little bit of project two and you just follow along the last little s instructions in the um, in the project two uh, workbook you know the, the little description of what you're supposed to do and you'll have done all the stuff that you need for project two.